Vander learns none of this. No worries there. Powder took care of the evidence. I tried, okay? You don't get it. You're older, you're bigger. It, it isn't fair. So stick with us. Take a punch or two. You wanna speak a bit louder? I don't think the entire bar hurt you yet. Not that it matters, since Vander isn't an idiot. And apparently the news has traveled fast. I don't suppose you can explain why it is that I'm hearing about an explosion and a foot chase topside? Four children fleeing the scene. What the hell were you thinking? Vander does as fathers do, and hands out a plentiful helping of scolding. And some might think this isn't all that interesting, but for me, it's a highlight of the episode. I'm a fan of characters, I'm a fan of dialogue. My favorite part in any story are always those moments when we focus on the characters and get to learn what makes them tick through the most fundamental means. Speech, words, are the most common way people interact, and that's why it always feels the most real to me when storytelling centers around dialogue. In fact, many of my all-time favorite stories are almost entirely dialogue-based, and I would assert that Arcane is at its best whenever we get a simple scene like this, with two or more people just talking. The dialogue in this show is great, it's sharp, to the point, it has weight, and every character has a clear, distinct voice. It's simply a joy to listen to. But what exactly makes for good dialogue? Stripped down, dialogue has two goals. One, to reveal information about the characters, and two, move the story forward. Even when a line achieves neither of these on its own, it should at least set up the next part of the conversation. Every moment in your story should have a purpose. Nothing is more excruciating than listening to aimless dialogue about something that has no bearing on the plot. Plainly put, don't have your characters talk about weather, Unless the story revolves around a literal hurricane. On the other hand, dialogue that acts merely as a dry info dump is just as painful. Characters should not feel like puppets of the author, dispensing information in a flat way. It's definitely the most grueling task when it comes to dialogue, finding the right balance between casual and informative and making conversations move organically from one statement to the next. An effective way to distinguish unnatural sounding dialogue from natural is to think whether the characters are talking at each other or with each other. Ideally, it would be the latter. The thing to avoid are statements that sound like the character is literally reading from a script, in a void, ignoring the person next to them, rather, Lines should blossom naturally in response to the previous one. Someone speaks, and someone else reacts to that. Not only by the words they say, but the tone of their voice. Where did you even get this tip? We just heard it at Benzo's shop. From? Little man. Oh. I took us there. If you want to be mad, be mad at me. Powder immediately spills the beans when faced with the topmost authority in her family. Feeling guilty, she tries to be as helpful as she can to make amends for the group's mistakes, as well as her own. Vi reacts to this and steers the attention to herself, taking the heat for the entire group, including their informant. She is to blame, no one else. Like in every aspect of storytelling, Cause and effect is the key. Characters act and react according to their personality. If, for example, someone challenges the decisions of a rebellious teen right at their face, you can be sure they will only double down. If you want to be mad, be mad at me. But you're the one who always says we have to earn our place in this world. I also told you time and time again the North Side's off limits. We stay out of Piltover's business. Why? They've got plenty while we're down here scraping together coins. What helps elevate the dialogue in Arcane is the visual side. The show looks amazing as a whole, but the most effective use of animation is found here, in these moments. The facial animation and body language. 
the sheer amount of information we can gather from the looks, the twitches, the stance, the way each character carries themselves, it's just immense. When did you get so comfortable living in someone else's shadow? Everyone out. Just look at that. A life and a half running through Vander's head. Vice mistakes are his mistakes. He was the one who inspired her and continues to inspire her. Once again, Vander has to take responsibility and set things right. Sit down. I'm fine. Sit. Down. This is what can be accomplished with animation nowadays, going so much deeper than just cartoonish extremes. Micro expressions, a window to the character's soul on par with live action acting, the directing and craftsmanship are top notch. This show sets the bar extremely high. I honestly do not live and die for visuals. But I would be intellectually blind if I refused to point out just how excellent this is. This conversation between Vi and Vander is one of the best moments of the entire show. Father and daughter, conflicting ideals, Vi's bratty abrasiveness gets demolished by Vander laying down the facts. Those kids look up to you. Yeah, I know. You know, but you don't know. When people look up to you, you don't get to be selfish. You say run, they run. You say swim, they dive in. You say light a fire, they show up with oil. But whatever happens, it's on you. It's interesting to think about. In many ways, why is Vander? She has inherited most of his qualities in just a few years. Fearlessness, determination, the charisma of a leader. She actively seeks responsibility for the team's actions instead of finding someone else to blame. However, the direction why aims these positive qualities is misguided. We make ourselves a problem for Piltover, and they will send the enforcers. So? Why answer to them? These are our streets, someone should remind them of You're that. You're not hearing me. That path? This? It's not gonna solve your problems. It just makes more of them. In this moment in time, she is the Vander from yesteryear, the passionate, short-sighted, violent Vander. That's what he is trying to teach her. He has walked this path, and knows that other people will be the ones to pay the price down the road. Why, and the gang have accomplished nothing with their crime. Even if they had succeeded, the price from the plundering would soon be gone. And what happens after that? The top side will still be at the throats of everyone in the Undercity. And for what? A moment of revelry? A couple of coins? A chance to stick it to the man? Which is extra ironic, considering that we soon learn about Chase, the owner of the apartment, who is undoubtedly the most altruistic person in the whole series. The kids didn't punch at the evil establishment. They just robbed someone working to better the lives of everyone. I want to underline this, because this was the moment that originally sold the show for me. The episode was doing fine so far, but here I was fully convinced that the rest of the show would be something I'd enjoy. Because right here, the show solidifies its vision when it comes to storytelling, in terms of style, character, and philosophy. This is not a story about black and white, good and bad, heroes and villains. It's a story about everything in between. Because that's how the world actually works. What is justice? Sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's debatable. But what it's definitely not is what the kids are doing. They are young, they are dumb, they are doing what they do to feed their own ego and in doing so invite trouble on everyone they care about. The topsiders see the Undercity as a wretched hive of scum and villainy. How do you suppose one can shed that stereotype? Well, the first thing to do is to stop acting like a bunch of scum and villains. How about that? 
The show gets more complex as time goes on, but for now, watching this scene for the first time, I was happy to see where the story was going. It's not about a pure evil empire versus plucky angelic rebels. I frankly have no use for that, nor should any adult watching a show aimed at adults. This show isn't about that. Arcane is a show about people struggling with what they have, in an imperfect world, working towards what they desire. They make decisions, some of them right, some of them wrong, and each of them lead to severe consequences. And as I say that, the show makes a tiny logical error. We lost it. All of it? Good. Nothing can tie you to what happened up there. Except all the people who saw the gang running for their lives. There are dozens of witnesses. Everyone saw their faces. They are literally looking for the specific foursome of teens consisting of a pink-haired girl, a blue-haired girl, Yuri Lowenthal, and a Digimon protagonist. What the hell are you talking about? Nothing can tie you to what happened. If the justice system in Piltover works with the logic of Pixar it never happened, then it's a villain's paradise. Come on, we were doing so well. That scene is like cancer. And now we just have to live with it. The reasoning here is that Vander will do his best to smooth things over with the top side and take the heat himself for what happened. But still, that statement is just silly. Anyway, aside from that small remark, the rest of the scene is fantastic. Owing to the show's great handling of dialogue, not just the text, but everything that bolsters it, Dialogue is not only the things literally being said, but the entire spectrum of interactions in between. Smiles, scowls, breaths, and even silence. Every little thing a character does delivers the story. And here's an obvious tip for organic scene construction. Give the character something to do while talking. Say, a father cleaning the wounds of his daughter. Just a tiny thing but it gives the scene some nice artistic contrast. Harsh words, caring hands, and it leads the conversation seamlessly from one topic into the next. How'd you get this? <laughs> some idiot was following us. On our side? Who? I don't know. He was after the stuff. You did put that idiot on his ass, though, right? Mm. <laughs> Vander is honestly such a cool dad. He's tough when he needs to be, but also openly proud of his children. Finding some common ground is always a wholesome way to end a conversation. Oftentimes the importance of dialogue gets overlooked by audiences. Many people remember stories for the big moments, the payoffs, the climaxes, the physical deeds the characters do. But without a solid foundation, the build-up None of that matters. So here's me, appreciating the simple things. I think a writer can accomplish so much more if they take their time, craft believable interesting people first and foremost, lay out a humble human foundation, before moving on with their epic tale. In the end, the effort is worth it. If the audience enjoys their time with the characters in their quiet moments, they will be invested in their fate as well. And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for sticking around for this long. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon, as well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.